This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. We begin tonight with the subject of freedom not quite at hand, but very close. It is four months now since the Iraqis invaded Kuwait and thousands of foreigners went into hiding. They are all on the verge of being free. And so are the eight American diplomats who've been toughing it out at the U.S. Embassy in Kuwait, surrounded by the Iraqis, and until, until a few days ago cut off from fresh food, they still have no electricity. The U.S. is going to close the embassy down. Here's ABC's John McQuitt. The U.S. Embassy in Kuwait and its small staff has been a symbol of America's refusal to bend to Iraqi demands. The State Department says the eight diplomats will leave once all Americans who want to get out of Kuwait are gone. The principal function of our embassy in Kuwait City has been to work for the safe release of all Americans in Kuwait. The State Department rationale for abandoning the embassy is that Ambassador Nathaniel Howell and his staff will have completed this job of representing Americans in Kuwait and can be of little additional use since they are virtually prisoners in the embassy. U.S. sources say there is another critical reason. It would remove from Kuwait the last Americans, thus clearing the decks for U.S. military action should President Bush decide that is necessary. Officials say it sends another signal to Baghdad that the military option is alive and well if Saddam Hussein decides not to withdraw. So Nat and Margie Howell, thank you so much for inviting us into your home to uh, talk about an event that, uh, that occurred 30 years ago uh, that really changed uh, the face of, of the world. Um, and you were there. You know, I, I know that one of the books that you wrote, Ambassador, was uh, Strangers When We Met, but I can say that for people at the University of Virginia and, and in this uh, Charlottesville area, you've never been a stranger. Uh, well, I was once. So many friends. When I was 17. Yeah. When, when, when did you first come to university? I came 60 years ago, two years, let's see. I was 17 years old. I came as the first German. And that was in 1958, 57, I'm sorry, 57, so. You were almost 18. Almost 18. That month. Turned. From the Tidewater area. From the, from the Tidewater area, where I grew up in Norfolk County. And Margie, uh, did you also come to this area about the same time? I had two years at Mary Washington over in Fredericksburg for the nursing program. At those, in those days, you went there first for two years or another school, then my upper class years were here. I came in 58, I guess. I'm wondering if you can tell us about those circumstances, your own personal circumstances, on August 2nd, 1990, 30 years ago. Where were you uh, when you heard about the news of Saddam Hussein invading Kuwait? Well, my wife has better instincts than I do. She always manages to get away before they act. I had come home the week before. I was here in the States, in Virginia. And you were I, in, the, well, I in was, the embassy. I was um, hosting a, um, a late dinner for a lot of people. We had gotten some spare ribs, which, you know, being poor, uh, the Marines and all enjoyed coming to eat, and we had a rather early evening, about 11 o'clock, and I went to bed, and about 2.30 I was waked up saying they're coming across the border. Who woke you up? Uh, it was a Marine guard over in the, in the Chancery, and uh, a political officer had been called in by a contact of his in the Kuwaiti police, who was calling from the border place. and. Uh, so that was the first uh, I got on the phone. We had a secure phone to Washington. So I got in touch with Washington and told him that the Iraqis were invading. Because it was a night, and um, we had spy satellites, but we couldn't see them at night. So that was the first word they got of it. And Margie, what about yourself? Well, there's a big hour difference between Kuwait and the States. Yes. But I got a call from the State Department. I also was asleep and wakened up, and I was here in Charlottesville at our, where we were, we were living then. And the man who became ambassador after Nat 
Edward Ganeen, a friend of ours, called me from the State Department. He was on duty and said, Margie, they've come across the border. And I said, oh my, I won't tell you everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> and I watched CNN, which had some early things. This is in the middle of the night. It was August 2nd by the time I heard. But it had started hours earlier when it was August 2nd in Kuwait. So I said, okay, I'm going to bed. We've been through crises before, and I know the first thing you need to do is take care of yourself. It's like the stewardess saying when the oxygen mask comes down, you put it on yourself first, then you can help other people. And as a nurse, I took that to heart. So I went back to sleep for a while. But you were up all from then on. Well, I never went back to bed, never got back in that bed again. I sat in my office from then on. Really? Um, I went to the, to the, uh, to the Chantry and, uh, we had given everybody, including all the American, private Americans, we couldn't order them around, but we told them not to leave the city during the coming period, because it was getting tense, but we didn't know what was going to happen. And we told people in the embassy to be available within an hour to come back to the embassy. So when we realized that by that time the Iraqi forces on the ground were around behind Kuwait City because we have these marvelous highways there which they came zipping down and been built by the Federal Highway Administration. And we began to see armor and all in town. Um, we uh, told everybody in the embassy to not, not to panic but to come to the embassy and bring as much food as they could carry. And, and private uh, possessions and all. And you're right. It was on a Thursday, which is our equivalent of a Saturday. In Kuwait. Yeah. In Kuwait. Yeah, it was, it, it was a weekend. Thursday. Um, that's why I remember that I had told them in the meeting with the American citizens not to, not to get out, don't go out of town this weekend. Well, so this is a <clears throat> kind of a basic question, but um, for those of us who were around at that time, we know that there was no social media. No. Uh, and even the embassy itself uh, was not the type of grand uh, structure that we often think about, particularly if we think about uh, major embassies in, in the Middle East. Can you describe that, that little embassy? place? And, and Well, I have a great fondness for it because <clears throat> a lot of the features that, look, that are so unattractive really helped us survive. It's on five acres as a result of a truck bombing in the early 80s. I had a nine foot wall around it with razor wire on top of it. And in there were a bunch of sort of prefab buildings. Some of them were, were not even permanent buildings. And the inspectors who came through said it has the aura of a well-maintained boys camp. But it was our our place and refuge, and it served us well. Now, as I recall, <clears throat> when I first went out there, there's a large, tall hotel. Yes. That is right across the street. It was originally the Hilton. Now, I don't know, El Nilo it was called or something. Now, I don't know what the was name it the was. Was the Saphir at that time? Or it was the Saphir at the time, yeah. I think it's another name now. So you had this hotel looming over you, and nine-foot walls are great, but um, this was a very large hotel. And yeah. what role did that hotel play <clears throat> during the occupation? Well, the Iraqis took it over, of course, and uh, they were bringing in some of their buddies and, uh, and putting them up in the hotel. And uh, I mean, people from other Arab states that were friendly to Iraq and things like that. And so. There were always people on, on that hotel. And Watching we, you. We had spent a lot of time. I remember one British guy came before this crisis, and he stepped out on his balcony and took a picture of the American embassy, and there was immediately a knock at his door. And somebody said, I'll take that film. So we, we had close surveillance on that before, but we didn't have any control after the invasion. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> so Margie, <clears throat> you say that you were watching CNN and, and getting news from CNN uh, all the time knowing that your husband was getting news that was maybe even more current. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Nat, during that time, what, what can you tell us about information you were receiving and the level of information that you were able to receive and convey? Well, we got information before this about the buildup of Iraqi troops in, in, inside Iraq. Of course, you know what's there, but you don't know what they're doing or intend to do with them. Now we knew. Um, we got some indications. My deputy and I had both worked on Iraqi affairs a great deal. And when we got a report of the meeting that, uh, that uh, Saddam Hussein had with uh, the ambassador, April Glassby, some of his language struck a bell. And he was talking much as he had talked just before he attacked Iran. So we sent a cable in <coughs> suggesting that we thought they might come across the border. We had no idea they planned to take the whole country. But we were not surprised that they came across the border because they had been up there before. They would come in, cause a furor, get whatever they wanted and go back. Mm -hmm. But on this occasion, <laughs> They continue to move down. They continue to move down, right, yeah. On the American-designed highways that he mentioned. From the border of Kuwait to, from the border with Iraq to Kuwait City, how, how many miles is that? It was less than 100. So they were able to move down very, Maybe very quickly. 60 or 70. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they could come fast. And without social media, how how was it that you were able to communicate uh, with expatriates, American citizens living in the city, yeah, um, but certainly not in the embassy at that time? Well, we had a telephone tree and a system of wardens who were from the community in particular areas. Uh, we had numbers. We had some places we could call, like the American school, we call the school, they get in touch with all the individual teachers and things like that. Um, and what we did was continually update that. Now, several days before the invasion, I had this meeting with the wardens, and we asked them to, to check their telephone trees, because this was summertime and a lot of people were out of the country in Kuwait. They go to Europe or places. And we wanted to make sure that there was, they didn't stop at some place where somebody who's supposed to be there, via link, is not there. So we tried to exercise that as best as we could. And it worked fairly well until the Iraqis cut our telephone. Mm -hmm. So, after hearing about this, uh, how what what were the changes? within the embassy? How many people could the embassy accommodate and did you find that there was an influx of Americans? Oh yes, most of, most of the staff came in uh, right away or over the next several days because there were Iraq, armed Iraqis in the streets. We didn't want them to do anything that might attract their attention. The, th the three things you do is warn your community, you bring in your employees, and we offered to anyone who wanted it to sanctuary in the embassy. I said, I say, we had five acres. We could, it might not be the most comfortable place in the world. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a good bit of food, uh, which we could stockpile. And uh, then you, you begin destroying classified information and equipment. So that went on for about three days. We ground up everything, including the Christmas card list. Mm -hmm because we didn't want the Iraqis to get in there and know who we were sending Christmas cards to. That was way down the line after you do get rid of the really, really uh, secret or sensitive, sensitive intelligence. If somebody had asked you at the time, one of the Americans, uh, Ambassador, how long do you think we're going to be here? What would your best guess have been at that point? I would not have made a guess. Mm -hmm. 
And at that, in considering the situation, I didn't see how we were going to get all these people out of here alive. I was afraid we'd have we'd have uh, casualties. We made preparations for a number of things. We lined up cars in a convoy in case we got a chance to run to the to the Saudi border down south, which is the closest exit. We began laying in supplies so that we could survive. So we tried to foresee any particular circumstance that might come along and, and prepare for it. One of the first things I did when I arrived there, we had Iranian silkworm missiles, which are land-to-sea missiles being shot from El Fao Island, which they had taken. And shortly after I arrived, one hit, hit Kuwait. And uh, unfortunately, it, it spooked a goat herd. It didn't do a million dollar goat herd. Uh, but that alarmed me because I knew we were vulnerable in the, in the uh, area of water, portable water. Most of the water in Kuwait is desalinated. So uh, I put extra fiberglass tanks on the, lots of extra fiberglass tanks to store water. And it served us very well. So you have to look ahead. You had arrived in Kuwait three years earlier and uh, you were- In August of 86. And you were preparing to leave. Me yeah, I was, I, was, I was actually due to leave. And, uh, but you see, in our system, the ambassador does not leave until his replacement can come. You, don't, come you, you can't be there at the same time because you both represent the president. You can't have two ambassadors in the same place. But you want the, second, the replacement ambassador to come in the day after the, the other one leaves. When was that scheduled? to have taken place? Well, the Congress was was fussing around. They were doing all sorts of things and not clearing any ambassadors, so we had no idea when that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. But Margie had already left, and she was in Charlottesville preparing for your re-entry back into the States. That's right, yeah. So you got a good sleep, I, I presume, after having gotten the, the news, Margie? Uh, <laughs> What what happened when you woke up and realized it was not a nightmare? Well, it was a nightmare even when I was awake. I was in touch with Mr. Ganim, our friend. Uh, he was the go-between at the State Department for talking to Nat, talking to me. And after a few days of getting some things through and other things not, things get garbled, he had a great idea. He said, Margie, I will make arrangements for you to come and be a volunteer on our task force. You know the area, you know the embassy, and you can talk to other people caught in this like you are, who have people over there. The crisis force was getting more and more calls every day about their loved ones. We had 2,500 Americans who were they left were there. Their own business or for mm -hmm. teaching purposes or whatever they were there for, just regular citizens. And they were out either hiding in their uh, homes or in hotels. And some of them had come to the embassy, I guess, by that point, too. But they were all over the place. And so I knew that people in the embassy started calling people as best they could to keep in touch and to warn them about movements around the city and everything. So I had enough information that I could reassure them. I could say, OK, I talked to my husband myself yesterday and they're doing this and that, and they're trying to keep everyone safe and to get them out of there as soon as possible. And I think that helped. Oh, it was a godsend, because the first thing, when you have a situation which is frightening and you have external, whether it's man-made or something like this epidemic, first thing you're tempted to do is blame the person you want to save you. So it's a thankless task to, to deal with these sort of things. She was able to diffuse that because she could always say, I've got, I've got skin in this game too. Mm -hmm. So uh, she was a big help to them. How, what did, did you do in your life or were there things in your life, Margie, that prepared you for such a stressful role? I think 
growing up a farm girl helped. I remember the Second World War. I was very young. But I remember the rationing and the hard work of producing our own food and going without things that we needed or wanted at the time. And that prepared me for a life in the Foreign Service to some extent because you can't always get the same sorts of goods that you want overseas, especially in the Middle East at that time. And you're sort of isolated on a farm. So we were always a part of a small minority of people in wherever we were serving overseas. We knew what that was like and how to survive storms that cut off your electricity at times. So I remember reading by uh, gas light, you know, by the lamps, the gas lamps we used to have, kerosene lamps. And the whole idea of being able to fend for yourself and take care of yourself when isolated from others helped. And becoming a psychiatric nurse was right along those lines of how to deal with stress, how to keep yourself busy, how to think, look on the positive as much as you can. You don't dwell on the bad stuff or you're going to get into a big, deep depressive pit after a while. And I think Nat and his group at the embassy worked very hard to keep up morale, to focus on what they could do in that limited environment. And I was very proud of them for doing that. What was your biggest frustration, Margie, in those in those first in that first week, in terms of? Oh, clearly the first week. What am I going to do to help? Mm -hmm. What's my role in this? Mm -hmm. I had enjoyed the three years of being wife of the ambassador there, mm -hmm. with the perks and the problems. And I wasn't. My role was not at all defined. What do What do I do? And that's where. Our friend helped me find a purpose and a meaning by coming to D.C. I could live with my sister in Annandale, so I could have had an escape. And I could go to Charlottesville on weekends mm -hmm. to get reset, to get some fresh air. But I was close to where things were happening, as close as I could be on that crisis task force. Perhaps this is the place to interject. The State Department gives an award every year <coughs> to the ambassador's wife who's done the most for her community. The Bolin Award was awarded to my wife. I'm very proud of her. Well, what a what a team uh, working together, even though you weren't together. Uh, so, in that first week yourself, Nat, did you have CNN? Were you watching? We had a, American television. Uh, they were very stingy about it. We got. Got uh, a satellite dish in the embassy just before this, not long before it, so that we could get the Armed Forces Network. And so I could sit there at 4 o'clock in the morning and watch Virginia play basketball sometimes. <laughs> um, we lost that because when the electricity went out, we were no longer tracking the satellite. Ah. And over time, we lost that. But uh, we had it at the beginning. We were talking earlier about about that first week. Uh, President uh, George Herbert Walker Bush was at Aspen at the time on August second with Margaret Thatcher. Right. And that week was really a very significant one in terms of American policy and response. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you were there, you know, in terms of having an understanding and appreciation from the Department of State perspective. Um, what do you recall about that? We, of course, were reporting to Washington what we knew, what we could find out. And we had a lot of people who call us and tell us things, this is happening there and that sort of thing. have to be careful in those circumstances because people report things that didn't happen. But... Um, when did you first get what, what, word from the Iraqis that you were supposed to leave? Oh, that was much later. They, we had no idea what the intentions were for weeks. We would stand mm -hmm. to every night uh, thinking they were trying to creep into the compound. 
And one night we heard a ruckus in the attic of these old buildings. And we gave a Marine <laughs> a flashlight and a pistol and put him up there. And what he found were feral cats were <laughs> in the attic space. It wasn't the Iraqis. And that was much relief. Um, so we didn't know what their intentions, they didn't come to the embassy, they didn't say, look, we're occupying the country, but you're okay, or didn't do anything like that. So we didn't quite know what to make of them. And uh, what we could do is monitor the fact that Kuwaitis, when they had a chance, were resisting. And we could tell Washington that there was no there were no Kuwaiti tra traders that we knew of who were in on this. The Iraqis tried to separate the opposition and all, and they wouldn't have it. So the Kuwaitis more or less stuck together. Uh, they tried to create a government in exile. Nobody knew who they were. They put them out on television. I don't know whether any of them were Kuwaitis or not. I, I suppose a couple of them could have been. But uh, the society had decided to reject them. And until September, remember in early September, all the women in Kuwait came out on their roofs one night and began to ululate. You know, that, mm -hmm. you've seen Lawrence of Arabia when mm -hmm. I can't do it. And this really spooked the Iraqis. They were pouring out of things with their guns blazing and. They had little fire control. They had no night with observation devices. They were just shooting at anything that moved. And uh, really uh, a pathetic response. Because, I mean, let's face it, most of these Iraqi troops, they didn't want to be there either. You know, a lot of them were conscripts. There were some like the Republican Guard who were enthusiastic supporters, but a lot of these were farm boys and all, peasants, who were conscripted and sent down there and treated like the devil. They were given one, they were lucky if they came by with one bowl of rice a day. No water, no... So they were expected to forage <clears throat> within the uh, the community? I guess. Uh, I they had to, to stay alive. We had a number of them come to the back of the embassy, to the, the gate back there where we had a guard, and offered to turn in their guns and, and uniforms if we give them civilian clothes and food. Hmm. So, I mean, they, it, was, it was impossible to hate people in, in that circumstance. Right. But from the beginning, they were surrounding you. Yeah, from the beginning, they surrounded us. But at first, you all could move in and out and go get support. Well, they didn't stop us from moving in and out. Then they announced that uh, all embassies had to be closed. They, they announced they were going to annex the country. That wasn't the initial announcement. And that all embassies had to be closed by a date certain in, de in July or August. And that's when we got the notice of when we were going to. So what we did was we got all the people that we didn't have to have in the embassy and got together a big convoy and we took all of them to Baghdad with the understanding they would continue on to Turkey. Well, the Iraqis, true to their word, didn't let them go on to Turkey. You made them stay there. Mm -hmm. And so they were, were hostages as well. Human we, shields? Well, I mean, they were not necessarily, they were in hotels and all. But, mm -hmm. Some of them got picked up and taken to potential targets. Mm -hmm. yeah. These were embassy people now who yeah, had yeah. diplomatic immunity. He couldn't just send any American out. I see. That was the problem. Well, we didn't accept that we had some very strange adoptions. And that's a tragic to see a parent give the, the child to somebody else because they think that's the only way to get to assure their safety. So embassy families adopted other people's kids and took them with them wow. on this trip. Eventually, they let the women and, and children. young and children under eighteen, <coughs> but they were they retained any college students you know had been visiting their families, any men, young men. They kept them and the embassy men there in Baghdad. They were at the embassy there. So, 
Matt, at what point uh, did you get a sense about the president's intention? Uh, well, of course, we were watching as everyone would, because I'm the president's representative out there. And um, I could only report what I did, the Kuwaitis were resisting, which is crucial, because if they hadn't resisted, it would have been impossible to support them. Um, and he had made some statements that could be interpreted that he was going to take take serious action against this. I talked to him once in that early period, and he didn't make any any hard commitments, but I think he we had a good conversation. And I told him I had my condition under control right now, and he didn't need to worry about us. So you were appointed. <clears throat> U.S. Ambassador to Kuwait by President Reagan right. in 1987. Right. But by the time that you were ready to leave in 1990, of course, President Bush uh, That's right. uh, was in charge. But I knew President Bush from before because my ambassador, when I served in, in Algiers, was a close friend of his from the U.N. They had served together in the U.N. So I had gone over and seen him with the ambassador. I had signed photos and everything. He's a very personable guy. And when I was in Algiers, he and Mrs. Bush made a, when he was vice president, made a visit to Algeria. And they stopped the reception to wish me a happy birthday, Mrs. Bush. Because it happened to be my birthday. So was he the, the leader for the time? I think, I think we had a number of people in key positions it couldn't have been better, mm -hmm. and that's including at the UN. Uh, well, the, the Pastor Pickering was it? Didn't Pickering at the UN. Um, we had we had a good crew going on there for that that time. I know that you had have told me before about uh, his communication style, President Bush's communication style. Yeah. Um, and how that may have uh, factored into the, the kind of trust that was developed in such a short time. Yeah. He's very fastidious about maintaining contacts and personal contacts. I never came back on home leave or recall for some kind of business that he didn't send a handwritten letter to the emir over for me to take back. I mean, in his own handwriting. And frequently we would get uh, instructions to set up a call with the Emir or the or the Prime Minister, Crown Prince, uh, at a certain time, and they would just chat. wasn't anything on the, on the docket necessarily, but that's the kind of maintenance of a relationship that carries over. Well, this is a time when so many people want to help, and and um, some of the advice that that you get isn't. <laughs> isn't all that helpful uh, well, were there times when well-meaning people really gave advice that was yeah, at best impractical there were and I understood where it was coming from I having been on the Washington end of crises like this as well as in the embassy you sit in Washington and you think you control everything and you don't you can't do anything about this situation and so you look for anything you can do. They came on, we knew, we had food. We could have lasted with food and water until April, and we got out in December. We could not have lasted and stayed in communications, which was rather important for a number of reasons. Because we had a limited amount of fuel for the generator. We tried to solve that. We had an agreement with the company uh, that provided the fuel, they were going to drive one of their trucks in and just leave it in the embassy. So the Iraqis couldn't steal it anyway. And he came, actually, on the day we were supposed to be shut in. The Iraqis, unfortunately, were operating on Baghdad time, which is an hour ahead of Kuwait. And so the embassy, they closed the embassy gates and, cl and the, put the blockade on as the truck was approaching, so it didn't get in. Anyway, that was our real vulnerability, was, was this uh, uh, electricity. And 
and uh, we also had uh, night movies and from the you know, VHS movies and things like that because we had a little generator. And so we, um, we were trying to uh, increase the amount of fuel we had. And the people in Washington got the idea that if we just got some bicycles and put all a bunch of people on pedaling the bicycles, we could generate electricity. So they kept, every time I got on the phone, they'd say, have you got those bicycles? I said, we don't have any bicycles on the car. And besides that, do you know what the conditions are here? It's 140 degrees and 100% humidity. We well, have to start burying the people on the bicycles. <laughs> so I, fi I finally got them off of that, but that was, was a, a constant refrain. Why, why don't you try pedaling the pikes? And you had you had a famous visitor, uh, Jesse Jackson, came to the oh, yeah. embassy. What yeah. was uh, when when did that happen? And I came in, in September. Um, he'd been there before. He'd been there before on, on a visit before the crisis, and uh, he came back and he went to Baghdad and he came down, and uh, I have to say he he did say, he did get some good people out. That was very helpful. That he started the whole series of flights, getting American women and children out. Yeah. So when you say you told the Iraqis, was there a liaison? Was there oh, someone we had who? Some colonels we could talk to. We didn't know where they were. Face to face or no, by no, phone, in Arabic. Uh, no, they spoke English. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how how did you know that they could be trusted? I didn't. Uh huh. So I. I, I followed Reagan's thing, trust and verify. Mm -hmm. But they were, they did help get the planes, the flights started. Okay. Yeah, after they decided people could go, we started uh, operating flights. And of course, none of us in the embassy could leave to, to help people get on the planes and that sort of thing. So we had to recruit wives, American wives or Kuwaitis and other people who knew their way around to get these people to the airport and through the airport customs into the planes. and Many of them came out too. Many of them came out. I mean, it's a miracle it works, but I mean, we nearly sweated blood that first flight until we heard it had gotten past Baghdad and was on the way to the space. And a few of those planes I actually was able to meet on this end in D.C. They came to various ports of entry. Yeah. All up and down the coast. Some of them ended in London. Mm -hmm. um, so we ran, I guess during the time we were there, we ran 13 of those flights without being able to get out and do it. We had lots of volunteers. A lot of Kuwaitis helped. They would find food for people who were hiding from the Iraqis in, in apartments. And they had cut not only the electric lines and the water lines, but they had cut the phone lines at one point. Or they, they tried to cut the phone. Well, they did, some of the lines. And some of the people you had were experts who could and figure out old They went in and found old lines. phone lines that were no longer in use, and they reactivated them. Which so is how they kept in touch with people outside the embassy. We published, we published uh, or somebody published during the whole time, practically, uh, a Hostage Times newspaper with jokes about the Iraqis and everything, and zipped it around by fax. The Iraqis didn't know anything about facts. I guess they learned, but uh, they're so squeamish about letting anybody in their country have electronics mm -hmm. that they just didn't know what a fax machine was. They heard these strange noises on the lines, couldn't figure out. And there it was, a cartoon of, of uh, Saddam Hussein floating over the line. Underground newspaper practice. So, you know, communication, I, I, I recall you telling me about what the Kuwaitis did to, to limit communication, <clears throat> even uh, with regard to street signs and, and, oh, and yeah. the like. Well, um, <clears throat> it was a real mixture. Some of these Iraqis, for example, at the Kuwait Foundation for Scientific Research, showed up some Iraqis who had worked there with a list of equipment that they were going to steal. So 
while they were working there, they apparently were keeping a list of what they wanted. Others of them, they had the foreign ministry and didn't realize they had occupied the foreign ministry, didn't know where it was. So the Kuwaitis were going around taking down street signs and doing things like that, or changing street signs, so they get all confused. So it was real, it was a mixture of, con of cunning and, and buffoonery. But what you had, in effect, and this, is, this has to do with the technology and all, was a less developed society trying to take over a more advanced one. I mean, the Kuwaitis knew all about banking and all these electronic transfers and stuff. The Iraqis were thinking there was gold in the bottom of those vaults. The Kuwaitis didn't have a lot of gold there. They had them invested. Uh. So, you know, in the, the Iraqis were coming in, they had to go find Indian clerks so they could operate the banks. Well, and then uh, when a country is occupied like that um, and, and services that one would expect are no longer available, how did the how did the Kuwaitis deal with that? For example, garbage collection and 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 all. That. <clears throat> well, um, Kuwaitis live in neighborhoods and they have names. You know, they're, they're not necessarily all one family, but there's a and there was in each one a co-op, which is a big grocery store. You could buy almost anything except alcohol and pork in in Kuwait. See, so Washington apples. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want. Department Papaya. store, you know, and a grocery store. You yeah. know, the whole kind of thing there. So, so in each neighborhood you had that sort of thing. They um, they um, operated through their, their co-ops. And they would have ladies' day quite frequently. Of course, the Iraqis would, didn't have any ladies with them. So they did all sorts of things like that to limit the Iraqis. They would move stuff off the shelves when the Iraqis came in. And of course, all the women, even Americans, went into the robes and the mm -hmm. coverings that the traditional Arab women wear, which also served as nice camouflage to you can carry get two, weapons could, could around. You carry two Kalashnikovs very comfortably under those robes. Mm, you're not caught. <laughs> You're not well, you quoted Reagan earlier on, Trust But Verified. Reagan had, had appointed you as, as the U.S. ambassador to Kuwait. Uh, tell us about that. I mean, that, that decision um, to, to be in that role and, and what others expected of you. Well, tell them where you were when you got the call. Oh, you were still with I was still with Central Command. I Tampa. came back from Christmas. Up here, and we got to Tampa, and there was a call. The president wants to speak to you. And unlike one of my colleagues who one time got that message and said, The president of what? <laughs> I just answered, and they said, We're going to nominate you for Ambassador to Kuwait. Well, it wasn't an accident. Uh, I'm not saying the president knew exactly what he was doing, but I had a friend who had worked for me when I was an office director. And he became uh, a high in the, the office of the uh, Inspector General of the Foreign Service. And they saw the list that was going on. What they would do was send a list to the White House of State Department nominees for a particular ambassadorial post. And on the list, I was on the list, but I was number eight out of ten. And the one in top was a guy who didn't know any Arabic, never been in the Arab world. He was an Afghan specialist. And somebody said, wouldn't it be nice to give him a nice cushy job like Kuwait? So he was their choice. Well, this guy finally got on and said, you know, you're out of your mind. I was the guy for this. He's got the Arabic. He's got the Arabic and, you know, he's been a country director. And so, I mean, it's, it's all accidental. Well, then that list goes over there, and the White House has its own list, which is political appointees. There was an assassination that almost involved you. In yeah, Rouge. yeah, Beirut. Really yeah, can you tell us about that? <clears throat> well, the ambassador was going to the east side of Beirut, which is where the Christian leaders were, 
and we had to go. We were on the western side, uh, which is a mixed area, largely Muslim, where AUB is and that sort of thing. And uh, they were stopped. Uh, he and Frank Malloy, who was a, a Norwegian American who uh, was the economic counselor in the embassy, and their driver, and all three of them were assassinated. Uh, we didn't know that for a while. We finally found out later. The problem was that the ambassador was going to speak with the Christians who spoke French, and um, the Norwegian counselor spoke French better than I did. If he'd been speaking Arabic, I'd have been with him. So that was the choice of languages helped me. Bad, my French wasn't any better, although. I really regret losing friends. You would have been in that car. Yeah. I was in Greece with the boys. We'd been evacuated several months earlier because of worsening conditions in the Beirut Civil War. And this is at the beginning of it. And there on the front page was my husband carrying a coffin, hmm. which he could have been in so easily. Yeah. I only make the International Herald Tribune on sad occasions. Mm -hmm. He also dodged a sniper's bullets in Beirut. There was somebody on the hill was shooting down at people as they went to the embassy, and one whizzed right by his cheek. It made him mad. <laughs> he sent a note. They had all sorts of people who would be curious between the different groups. Just basically, what telling them to stop it? Oh, cut it out. Cut it out. The tall guy or something you did. He said. He got back a message. The Falan sniper said, sent back a message saying, okay, and he sent me his shoulder patch. So I have a shoulder patch for a Falan sharpshooter. Of the sniper. Wow. Who, who got killed eventually himself. I'm sure. So was there something about your personality, do you think, that, that, that led the decision to, uh, to be named ambassador to Kuwait? It was something about... About you and <laughs> I don't know what you're asking. Those were well wishers that said that. Uh, this wasn't the reason for it. But some of my colleagues said the Kuwaitis had a reputation for being very frank, and if they disagreed with you, they'd tell you right to your face. I mean, uh, most hours they say, mm, "Let's get past this unpleasantness." And not the Kuwaitis. No, the Kuwaitis is like, "No, we don't agree with that." So. Some of my friends said, well, you're just the ideal for Kuwait. He said, they're so hard to deal with, and so are you. You would do fine. Well, it may be true, but if it is, it worked. Because I got along fine with the Kuwait. Now, as time went on, um, we go from August to September to October. It really wasn't until December. Early December. That... You? Uh, that you got the word to come back. So, in those in those last months that you were there, uh, not knowing the future, uh, seeing the build up, how did you maintain morale? Or can you comment about what morale was like? How many how many people were in the embassy with well, you at that point? We initially had about seventy. And some of those were women and children. We actually ran, were running a school for children for a while. Um, and we, as we got some of them out, some of them were Arab Americans. They began letting American, Arab Americans out. Um, so it peeled down to about 40 at the end. <coughs> and they were all, all Americans except for one houseboy who got caught there. Spoke no English. So you had like eight official Americans. Yeah, eight official Americans. The rest were just citizens caught up. Oh, that's yeah, that's right. And mostly men. Um, you know, I didn't know quite how to handle this. I I had a real shock when I went back to the embassy the day we had sent the convoy off, and there, sitting behind the desk where there usually was a well-turned-out Marine was this wild-eyed looking guy with hair and a bandana around his head. And he looked, you know, I said, what is God's name if I got here? 
uh, it turned out he was a very nice guy. I got to know him very well. And that's true of everybody, I think, for the most part. What we did, I told them, you know, we we won't leave you. That was what they were afraid, that the diplomats would, would get a chance to go and leave. Mm -hmm. The first meeting was very dramatic after you got surrounded. Yeah, well, the, the lights went out. They cut the electricity. In the middle of his talk, telling them that we're going to work with you and not leave you. I said, we won't, we won't go without you. And... Uh, Mean we're all, in, the, we're all in, in this together. Well, then we assigned everybody jobs. And that's vitally important. You're never so helpless there are not some areas where you can control things. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find those. Um, and it worked so well that that became sort of the ethos of a community that cooperated very well together. Uh, I had one fellow who almost created an incident. He was trying to get out of the embassy. He was drunk as a fish. He had dipped into the alcohol ration and gotten drunk. And he was trying to get out of a turnstile gate. If he'd gotten out there, he'd probably been shot. We got him back in, and I said, what the hell am I going to do with this guy? I don't have a jail here. So I said, <clears throat> if you ever do that again, I will take your job away from you. He was a guard. Mm -hmm. He pulled one of the guard details. I thought you took him off, actually. I took him off for a couple of days. And then I said, you know, he came to me and he said, can I have my job back? I said, well, not if I can't trust you. I won't touch another drop as long as I'm in here. And he didn't, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Because that was his status in this community. This was a community that was depending only on its own people, on what resources they had, to keep life going. So you had people in the kitchen, people preparing food, people cleaning up. People, people digging for water. Digging uh, the what do you call them, bathrooms outside. Latrines, yeah, yeah. Latrines. Growing, they had a people growing, working in a garden. And as the weather got better, you could have a winter garden. You had people at all the the two gates, all all twenty four hours around the clock. So you had a whole roster of those they people. Had people manning the telephones. With, and with that was people. very important, keeping in touch with all the people in the outer community on those telephones and getting information and warning them when you had information that the Rockies were picking up people in one area, keep a low profile or get to a different place. Get to another, somebody will yeah. be by to pick you up. Someone who, we had Australians and New Zealanders, New Zealanders and, and Kuwaitis, and Kuwaitis and all Palestinians, who risked their lives Lebanese. helping Americans be safe. We brought them. three of the Arabs out with us uh, who had been instrumental in taking care of and saving American lives. and. We asked for humanitarian asylum for them, and it took them so long they went back. I mean, it was a real disappointment because they had earned it. So, in terms of morale, besides jobs, um, were there things, rituals? Uh, you had a buddy system, didn't you? Well, we had a buddy system. Um, Everybody was supposed to sort of watch everybody else <laughs> and see if they were cracking up. Uh, and they could have somebody to talk to. We had... The, Did you have a buddy? No. That's, somebody asked me. One of the guys finally said, well, who do you talk to? I said, God. But did the doctor watch you? Huh? I thought the doctor was watching right, He was watching me. He's the one who asked me. Okay. Um... <clears throat> we had a church service for those so inclined every evening, Vespers. Mm -hmm. We had a, a minister from the American Mission. Yeah. We had parties on various occasions. We had a happy hour at, when, the, when the transmissions shut down up at the embassy. We would uh, go have a drink. We developed a drink called a hand grenade. <laughs> um, 
and after that there was a movie. Hmm. And when the movie went off about 9.30, it was lights out. I went to bed. The Marine Guards had a whole library of <coughs> movies and stuff. Well, there so. was one with the flow, too. And uh, the funniest one was when they were arguing whether or not they should show the Alamo, the movie, about the Alamo. Yeah. So somebody put up a sign of which... No, no, that's a different... That's a different story. Well, okay. Um, the one on the Alamo, I said, well, you know, I think that would be depressing to see those people in the Alamo. I said, what do you mean? They were not nearly as outnumbered as we are. <laughs> you watched it? <laughs> Did you watch it? Yeah. The other one was when they decided that there should be a movie. Yeah, they were going to make a movie of this experience. Of the siege. <clears throat> so someone put up a piece of paper with took a piece of sheet of yellow paper and wrote everybody's name down there and then invited people to say who should play them in the movie and the one the place beside the ambassador was nothing written in there for years I kept going by and looking at days it seemed like years yes. it seemed like years <laughs> um, and I would go by and look and finally one day I went by and there was something written there I went over and looked and it said Charlton Heston. And I said, Boy, that's very flattering. Uh, so I found the little boy who, who wrote it up there. And I said, why do you think Charlton Heston play, should play me? He said, well, didn't he play Moses? I said, yeah. Moses got his people out. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> I had a chance to tell that to Charlton Heston at the film festival here. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you have to take care of yourself, and you have to take care of your people, and then you have to keep them occupied. There's nothing any worse than a situation where you are feeling yourself helpless than to be helpless, than to do nothing and worry on it, because you will just drive yourself nuts if you try to figure all the things that could happen to you. You didn't have turkey for Thanksgiving? No, we, we had tuna fish. Fortunately, the, the truck that was bringing in food, he parked beside the tuna fish every day. We had 67,000 cans of it. And we had, you know, I could feed it to the Texans and all as long as it had Sneaky Pete hot sauce to go on it. Uh-huh. Well, we were listening to the news on a portable radio one morning, and they said uh, that Saddam had decided that everybody could leave. And I knew that that was not <laughs> definitive as far as I was concerned. So we had to wait until that afternoon. And when I was talking to the department, I said, we heard this on the radio. They said, yes, it's true. It's true. And we want you to block the embassy, but don't take down the flag or don't de-staff it. I said, you sure you don't want me to stay? And he said, no, no, we, we want you to come out after all the Americans have had a chance to come out. So that was, I think, on a Saturday. And we stayed till the following Wednesday or Thursday and ran two flights. And I came out on the last one. I yeah. also, I saw earlier, sent three of my, my eight FSOs or Foreign Service employees out I only kept three with me, four with me. It must have been an amazing time for you, Margie, uh, and all of these people that you were you were working with for so long. Of course, they had they were told they had to come out on planes, Iraqi planes. So first they fly to Baghdad and change planes there. Then they fly them in an Iraqi plane to Germany. So I did not feel he was safe until he had landed in Germany, mm -hmm. where he then took a long bath. He said <laughs> he left a lot I of I brought Kuwait. a lot of Kuwait with so, me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Yeah. I remember a front page story in our own newspaper in town, and as well as uh, many, many other newspapers as well. Uh, the fact that uh, you all were coming back. Yeah. Um, how long did it take to decompress? <laughs> well, uh, we had 
we had no stop in Frankfurt or any place for decompression. So we came out to Frankfurt, spent the night in a hotel, and then got on the plane the next morning. And that's when the air bridge was going on. You know, we passed all kinds of. I was used to flying in those planes. Cause I used to fly with the sink, the command in chief of Central Command. And so I would sit there with them and watch. There'd be planes going in that direction, and we'd be behind one. Uh, they were getting ready for the war. And um, so we came back, and you don't do it a, uh, um, in, a, in a moment. I mean, it takes some time to. I remember being down at, at Marge's home, and they were talking about things to me were inane. And I didn't want to be around it, you know. I mean, life was too serious for that. I mean, they were just being normal. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. Of course, we we didn't know what the outcome would be. Uh, this no. was still Desert Shield. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, we still had a lot of friends there. Yeah. So you uh, were appointed as a research professor at the University of Virginia in Foreign Affairs? No, a diplomat in residence. Diplomat first. in residence first, and then, and then your research professorship. Yeah. When he retired, he took on the professorship. And that, that led to, really a remarkable project, and which is how I got to know you both, right. uh, the Kuwait project. Can you tell us, a bit about that, and 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 how it originated uh, with the with the center and. Um, um, the importance of that project. Yeah, well, um, the Kuwaitis recognized <coughs> that this occupation had had a tremendous effect on their society. And they wanted to know how and why and what it meant. And I thought that was pretty perspicacious of them. Um, so, in talking with the Social Development Office, which was a branch of the Amiri Diwan, the Diwan is the Amir's office, they gave us a, a small grant for the university to undertake a study. And we, I, we put together a group, which Greg was in, of people who had um, experience in psych and dynamic uh, interviewing and things like that, psycho psycho psychological mm -hmm. interviews. And area specialists, we, I got graduate students who were studying the Middle East and Kuwait. And, they, and we made, I guess, well, a couple trips out there mm -hmm. and got some very raw and very revealing interviews. And there were several things working in our favor. The first was that Kuwait, not being a poverty-stricken nation, had recovered in basic needs. They were not starving, they were not sitting in the dark, that sort of thing. Uh, as so many post-traumatic stress situations are. The other thing was that we were not Kuwaitis, but we were the next best thing because there was a great deal of affection and, and appreciation for the United States. Trust. So they opened up to us in, in ways they wouldn't open up to one another. And we had a number of them tell us that they had known these people and they never told them that, their experience. Some of them were so horrible. But um, I think out of that we came up with, with a report which is a good uh, cross-section or analytical cross-section of what a trauma-sized society goes through. And one of the aspects was, was in uh, regarding monuments. Yeah. I mean, as I recall, there were some tanks, Iraqi tanks, that were in intersections. Yeah. There were some buildings that had been destroyed, and, and these were, um, had very special meaning. Yes. And, um, well, the buildings that were destroyed was where the Iraqis had cornered a resistance group or something and gone after them. The tanks were there for the picking. I don't know how many the Iraqis lost. Mm -hmm. 
We left a lot of tanks in, in Kuwait. Um, but we were we were trying to help them find monuments or ways to interact with one another. Um, we found one group of men who had been prisoners of yeah, the they, Iraqis they had been prisoners and they, and they had, had sort of formed their own support group. Our little D. Ramia. And around. sharing their stories, which was very healthy, very good. Helped them work through what had gone on because they, they could share it with people who understood who had been in the same horrible straits. This uh, project was, was also under the auspices of uh, uh, Van McVulcan in the in the School of Medicine, who had such a strong interest in trauma, traumatized right. societies, and and the symbolic nature. So it really fit in with so much of the work that he had done in other war torn areas. And as mm -hmm. as I understand, there not only Kuwait, but there were other societies that you were involved with as well. <clears throat> subsequent to that, the former Soviet Union. Oh yes, we, we worked in the Baltic states. Primarily. primarily in Estonia, where they had had 50 years of occupation by the Russians, and lots of problems after that stopped. So these, so much of this is really translatable from one society to another. The yeah, the cultural you know, differences. The cultural obviously, differences uh, make them it may make them express themselves in different ways, but. Still, the basic same problem of hostility and trust, and uh, how you leech a wound like that. I recall being in Kuwait with you uh, on that first trip and uh, walking down a street, and um, a woman, a Kuwaiti woman, ran across the street. Actually, there was traffic on the street to to hug you. I mean, she saw you. I mean, you were really a symbol for for the United States at that time. Yeah, I don't think we really knew in the embassy how much that was true. But as long as the embassy stayed, somebody was witnessing their torture and their torment. And I guess that makes a lot of difference. You were we were friends who stayed. Yeah. Yes. So as time went on. You, you wrote a book, and then you wrote another book. <laughs> Two very different books. Two uh, very different books. One uh, uh, called Siege, Crisis Leadership, the Survival of U.S. Embassy Kuwait, right. uh, that you wrote with uh, Roberta Culbertson. Yeah. How hard was it to write this book? It took 10 years, didn't it? Well, no, it didn't take 10 years. I mean, she did a lot of the hard work of transcribing everything. I just sat and talked, mainly. The other book, uh, larger, took more time to write, I guess. <laughs> 20 is, years. Uh, Strangers When We Met. This is a for century, libraries. <laughs> a century of American, Ku uh, American community in Kuwait. Tell us about this book. Well, this started out. I found out a lot of things about Kuwait when I got to the embassy, including about the American mission and, you know, things you don't normally hear about. And I started thinking, well, it would be nice if we had a pamphlet we could give to visitors to the embassy to clue them in on some of these things. A little bit of the history. And, and so I started picking up oral histories, which is my passion, is oral history. Um, Unfortunately, I got some people before they died who, who had parts that couldn't have been repeated by anyone who, who hadn't been there. Elderly Kuwaitis. Uh, I got a lot of materials and it just kept growing. Going back to, to where it began, where, where both of you met, um, were there some things that you saw in, in that back in those undergraduate days that showed a, a glimmer of, of what might occur later on from your standpoint, uh, Margie? I had no idea what the future held. If I had, I'd have probably run. 
<laughs> but having fallen in love and starting a family here, both our boys were born here mm -hmm. and also went to school here as we did. We all had our basic degrees from UVA. Um, I knew he was a very smart cookie. He was tall and dark, you know, and uh, very smart, very humorous. Mm -hmm. He was in the Jefferson Society. He was in the Jefferson Society. The debater. And he was bringing in renowned speakers from all over. I mean, he, he did an impressive lot of good here at UVA when he was an undergraduate even. So would you say, Nat, that that was, was really a, a, a great foundation for you in terms of your, your future career, your education oh, yeah. at the university. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it, you know, they worked us hard. I remember I came in, I took a liberal arts seminar, which was a two-year course, and great, sort of a great books thing. And boy, you were given Thucydides to read for next week. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or Didikin on the theory of numbers, to read for next week. We discuss, and you know you're working yourself off, but you're getting so much. I mean, I've I've read everything from Jean Baptiste Vico to you know incredible what I've been uh, acquainted with. And that was attractive to me. <clears throat> In nursing, you were more focused on basic sciences and the nursing aspects of it, and. Uh, I, I called it boot camp. I mean, in those days, you know, you stood up when the doctors came into the nurses' station and things like that, and it's gotten much more egalitarian, if you will, and teamwork now. And I was in that transition period, too, as nursing changed in relation to medicine, and that was a much healthier direction, too. So we thought we were in different fields. He didn't want to marry somebody who was exactly like him in terms of their knowledge, and I certainly wanted to broaden my horizons. Later we realized we were sort of in the same thing in terms of mm -hmm. human relations, me on an individual and group sort of thing more, he with nations and big, big groups, um, both of which get traumatized and stressed, and we help him work through those things. So. We're in sort of the same field in a way, just coming at it from different directions. So being a change agent, you, you, you even had that in your background when you were at, at, uh, at the university with the Colonnade Club. You were telling me that story. <laughs> well, that was an accident. I was, I was uh, holding, you know, that was the time when all these African nations were getting independence, Kenya and all that. So uh, we had a speaker, we had a speaker every week at uh, Jefferson Society. And I was having a series on, on Africa. And uh, among others, I had the last South African ambassador in this country before he was PNG. And one of them was Ralph Bunch, who was a magnificent diplomat. Mm -hmm. He'd done, done a lot of UN work in Palestine and the Congo and places like that. African American. African American. So I invited him to come and speak to the Jefferson Society. We it got so big we had to hold it in Capitol Hall and get some other sponsors. And uh, came the process we were making arrangements for dinners and things like that. Those weren't a problem, but finding a place for Dr. Bunch to stay was a problem. It was an overnight visit. Yeah, well, he had to stay overnight. Uh, so, I, that was my first arrangement with the Colony Club, and uh, I was able to convince them that he should stay there. And that was the first time yeah. an African American. Yeah. First time an African American. As far as I know, yeah. Well, I hope this isn't the last time that uh, you have an opportunity to um, to share your memories with the Colony Club once. Uh, COVID-19 uh, <laughs> is, uh, is, is part of history. There are parallels with what we're going through now with this virus and his four months plus in the embassy there. We're feeling isolated from each other, having to completely change how we do things and not sure when, it, when it's going yes. to get better or different. 
What are your thoughts about that, Nat? The uncertainty, mm -hmm. I mean, radically changed environment, and people don't have all the answers. No, they don't have the answers, and you know, nor could I have told you what, how we were going to get through those months in Kuwait and, and what the end would be. Um, I think it was fortunate for us that suddenly we hear we can go. It's not that, you know, somebody said you can go in 10 days. That's terrible. So mm -hmm. you think you're looking for, or you can go in three months and you can go. If suddenly they, they make the decision it's here. That, that's the way to end it. Well, that's not going to happen with this. Well, uh, you know, they may find a, find a, uh, a cure or Vaccine. Even vaccine. when they do, it's going to take a while to get it. Well, it's going to take a while, yeah. yeah. People then be angling to get in the front of the line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Really um, um, privileged to, to sit down with you and, and hear these uh, insights. And what a great way to look forward to the 30th anniversary of this. Absolutely. And then. <laughs> Uh, we'll be opening this up then to to questions from the audience so that they can ask you um, uh, their own questions about this fascinating presentation. Thanks so much. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ford Cleveland, and I'm the current president of the Virginia Gentlemen, UVA's first a cappella group. I'm honored to be able to dedicate this next song, the good old song, to two UVA graduates, Ambassador Howell and his wife, Margie. The Virginia gentlemen have long enjoyed singing this song for countless alumni, guests, and faculty at the university. And how perfect is it to know that the Virginia gentlemen actually came into existence the very same year that Ambassador Howell first set foot on grounds. This song is a time-honored tradition for any UVA student, and we are thrilled to be able to sing it today for the two of you. We hope you enjoy, and wahoo wah. The good old song of Wahua will sing it o'er and o'er. It cheers our hearts and warms our blood to hear them shout and roar. We come from old Virginia, where all is bright. Well, what an absolutely wonderful, wonderful video. So if, Margie, how are you doing this evening? We're so glad to have you join us. And Fahad, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We would like to um, go ahead and open up the session for questions. Um, if there are any questions that anyone has. Um, I, have a, I have a couple of questions. Um, Margie, can you talk a little bit about um, how you were able to work with the families and things on this side in the United States. Um, what kinds of things could, were you able to do? It, communicating with them and other kinds of things. Can you talk a little bit more about that role and how critically important it was? I was able to use the phone system in the State Department and that gave me a way to contact people and I could also take phone calls coming into the department. And people were just worried sick about their families and their friends. And I tried to help them think in terms of, we know things are okay and calm today, 
and we will hope for the best and to keep a positive note. I also worked with the uh, Kuwait Embassy and their people, they were very stressed over there. Their country having been completely taken over and made some really good friends there too. And one of my friends got together the wives of some of our military people and some of the embassy wives and they helped each other understand why this was necessary for our troops to help them in this situation. Well, that's great. So your experience as a psychiatric nurse probably helped as well, I would think. Oh, I, there's no doubt about it. I'm interested in how we handle stress, how we think it can make a big difference in how we handle the situations we're in. Well, that's great. That's great. Fahad, from your perspective, can you talk a little bit about what the impact of this um, this 30 year um, anniversary has and the invasion of Kuwait has on what your perspectives are in terms of um, the Middle East and what you think are the most important things? Um, first of all, let me say thank you for, for having me on here. It's, it's uh, great to be a part of this. And watching, watching this video, which I, I've just gotten to watch for the first time uh, this evening, uh, it, it really brought back a lot of memories uh, from, from that time. I was very young when the invasion uh, took place. Um, I was only seven years old. Um, and um, I mean, I, I have memories of uh, pre-invasion Kuwait that uh, I sort of buried in the deep recesses of my subconscious, and I don't think I'd, I'd really sort of recalled them until I'd seen some of the scenes from the video tonight. Um, and, you know, I should say um, I was not in Kuwait during the invasion. Um, so that, that summer, the invasion took place in August, of course. Um, that summer, that July, my older sister and I were, we were we were traveling here in the United States with my dad, um, and you know he would take us every couple of years um, to, to to different cities around the country just to, to visit. Um, and it was while we were over here that we learned that the country had been invaded, um, and so we flew then to Saudi Arabia, uh, where my uh, great uncle was uh, was working at the time as a, as a diplomat. And um, and uh, my my father, after about a week or two in Saudi Arabia, my father said, "Well, listen, uh, I have to go back to Kuwait now. Um, you you two are going to stay here." Uh, and so he left us with his uncle, uh, and that lasted maybe two days. And then my uncle sent us off to my father's sister in Cairo, and then we were separated from our family until the uh, the end of the invasion, which was about. I think it was it was probably it was seven months that the invasion lasted, but it was probably nine months um, uh, since that we had been uh, separated from them. Um, and you know, thinking about what what Nat was saying, it sort of there were there were all sorts of things that resonated uh, with me from what he was saying in the video. You know, there was no social media at the time, of course. There was actually no real way of calling one another. Um, in, in the video, Margie said that the phones didn't work. They didn't work. We, we couldn't call our families in Kuwait. There was no way of being in touch with our parents. Um, uh, so we were separated from our family, separated from our friends, and news would trickle in from time to time uh, through, through various sort of uh, people who would, who would leave the country. Um, and our aunt, who we were staying with in, um, in Cairo, was, was doing her best to really provide us with a sense of normalcy, routine, uh, sending us to school and uh, and things like that. Um, uh, of course, um, that was that was a long time ago. And although, you know, I I lived with the the legacy of the of the invasion for a very long time. Uh, you know, growing up, you know, in Kuwait, there was always you know in, in the in the immediate aftermath of the invasion, when we were there. It was very clear that the country was just completely different from from what we had known before. Um, entire buildings were missing. Uh, sides of buildings had been taken out. There were there were uh, weapons and and um, you know bullets and ammunition all over the place. 
uh, and it was a very dangerous place to be. Uh, but uh, you know, I was by the time I got back, I was eight. Uh, you you didn't know any better. You thought it was normal, uh, and it really it really um, uh, sort of sheds a different light on you know to think of what uh, Margie and Ned were talking about towards the end of what we're going through right now. You know, I have I have small children. And I often wonder, oh, you know, how, how strange this must be for them. And you forget how resilient children are and how, you know, uh, everything just is, is about as normal as it could be to them, as long as the, the, the parents are there and, and providing that, uh, that stability. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I can, I can speak of what the ramifications of, of 1990 were for the entire Middle East. I mean, certainly, the uh, there's there's a very direct link uh, between uh, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, uh, American involvement in removing Saddam Hussein's troops, and then um, all of the discourse, of, you know, that that uh, Osama bin Laden was uh, was expressing prior to 9/11 about uh, American troops being allowed on uh, on uh, in in the in the region. Um, and uh, of course, you know the 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 sort of post-invasion fissures uh, really uh, sort of forced a recalibration of American strategy in the region. You could no longer count on Iraq to contain which what was thought to be the the principal threat at the time, which was of course Iran. Um, uh, and so there there had to be a sort of a reconfiguration of of what uh, American military investment in the region would look like. Um, but from a, you know, from a, a personal perspective, uh, there was, you know, none of that, none of that was very clear to me. Um, we, we didn't have any real memories of, uh, of Iraq. What, what we did know was, and, and this is the part of the video that really sort of spoke to me and resonated with me, uh, was when when um, they were speaking to all of the Kuwaitis post invasion. It was a real sense of rupture, a real sense of uh, a sort of a breach in the social and uh, sort of psychological and emotional fabric of our lives. Um, that that something something had changed, and you know none of us could quite put a finger on exactly what had changed. But you know we, every, anybody who was around prior to the invasion and then you know lived afterwards could tell you that. There are two Kuwaits. There was a pre-invasion Kuwait and there was the post-invasion Kuwait, and the two are not the same at all. Um, of course, again, that was 30 years ago. Since then, there's been a whole generation that's lived up, uh, lived and grown up, and um, that for whom the the invasion is a is a really very, I mean, either a distant, very distant memory or uh, not a memory at all. They've grown up afterwards, um, and you know this this. Uh, Having grown up around these people, and and you know, grown up in a Kuwait that was pushing that memory further and further and further back, uh, and trying to trying to cram it into this the sort of closet and trying to not let it get out as you know as much as um, there there needed to be a reckoning uh, post invasion that never actually happened. Um, uh, you know, one one sort of moves on in life, and other things happen, and then. I ended up here at, uh, at uh, UVA and uh, meeting Nat and Marge, and it was all it was all chance, and you know maybe we can talk about that. But then it all sort of the floodgates opened back up, and then all of those memories and all of those connections and all of the connections that we had with one another, and um, you know the, the the past was sort of pouring into the present in in really in really uh, vivid and emotional ways. Well, thank you very much. That's so enlightening um, because I, you know, from a distance, we had it in the United States perspective, but to understand that the countries became really two very different countries, you know, in terms of their culture and their fabric and, and those kinds of things is, is just really important. So um, talk a little bit about what you're doing at UVA currently, you know, what you're rolling and how you got to know the house a little bit, and then um, that would be great. Sure, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do that. Um, so uh, I should say that I, I came to UVA not knowing uh, about the Howells being here or about uh, Nat, uh, Nat's work with, um, with the university and, and his, his work in the study of the Arabian Peninsula and the Gulf. He'd run an institute out of here. We'll just call it APAG for, 
uh, for short. Um, and so I arrived here under very different pretenses, uh, the faculty member in the history department. They didn't even hire me to, to teach the Middle East. I, I'm here as a historian of the Indian Ocean. Um, and then, um, and then in my, it was in my second year, I believe, that uh, my, uh, my, the chair of my department, Karen Parshall, gave me a call and said, um, I need to speak to you about something. And I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. What did I do? <laughs> and then uh, she called. So I walked up to her office and she said, well, you know, it's good news. Don't worry. Um, but we're going to have to get you some uh, very wide letterhead. Uh, and so it, then they told me about the, the Ramazani professorship. And she said, would you, would, you be, um, would you be interested in this? And I thought, well, OK, this is great. Again, not knowing what the backstory was to it. Um, or anything like that, and it was only later that um, the, the the people in the sort of the fundraising arm of the university suggested that I meet with the Howells, and it was when we met uh, at uh, Aroma's Cafe um, that uh, it all sort of washed over me. Uh, sort of really, you know, our meeting really took me back uh, thirty years, um, and it you know. We, it was it was very clear you know that we had we obviously had very very similar intellectual interests that's what immediately brought us into the same room um, but but more than that we um, we had friends in common we knew the same people uh, we knew them from very for very different reasons um, but we knew the same people um, and we uh, we had memories in common we knew the same sorts of places places that didn't exist anymore uh, places that only existed in our in our memory, um, but but we remembered them, um, and we lived we had lived totally different worlds, um, and had sort of intersected at this moment. And in that moment of intersection, it became uh, I mean it was it was just amazing to me to think that we were sort of in the same place, living in the same place at the same time, but having totally different experiences of that place and knowing people who knew people who, you know, we were, there, were, there were probably only two degrees of separation between us, but we never had actually, uh, had actually met. Um, and then over the course of, of several meetings with, with the Howells, it became, uh, became like family to me. And, and over the last year, especially, I've, I've become, uh, you know, uh, quite quite attached to them. I have to say, uh, they've become the, my 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 family here in in Charlottesville. And uh, you know, I've I've come to learn about what their vision is was for the the, the chair itself, and then uh, the uh, APAG Institute, and then you know, working with Nat over the last um, twelve months or more to really uh, make that that vision a reality. And the the goal is to build a program here where people could come to study the Gulf and Arabian Peninsula, um, which isn't something that one can really do in the, uh, in the American Academy, uh, surprisingly. There's a lot of the study of the Middle East, but very few people study the Gulf. The Gulf is the sort of the margins of the study of the Middle East. Um, and uh, it's, um, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good work out there, but there hasn't really been a hub in the US where people can come and share their work where students can come and study, uh, and really, in the you know over the past uh, twenty years or so, it's the 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 English who had who had taken over the academic study of the Gulf and have really sort of eaten our lunch, so to speak. Uh, and so, and there's no there's no good reason there's no good reason for it. Um, and so, you know, working and and Nat and Nat and I and you know we we both agreed on that point, and Nat and Marge and I sort of worked together to. To try to build this thing now, of course, then uh, COVID happened, and you know plans change, and uh, you know it's it's unclear what the future what the future looks like. But what is clear is that we're all committed to this, and we're all committed to building this. And uh, we already have some excellent graduate students here who are working on the area, and we hope to continue to attract more and to to really build a community of scholars and uh, and uh, other uh, other students here. Uh, to study the place and really anchor the U anchor the University of Virginia uh, on the sort of the map when it comes to the study of the region. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, Marge, Margie, would you like to say a few things about the professorship and the and the new center? It took that many years to get that professorship on its 
in its foundation and started. And we were so surprised and pleased to find the perfect person to fill the chair right here under our noses. You know, so much depends on getting the right people to help you work, go through the bureaucracies, I think. Uh, UVA has gotten larger and there are so many things that demand our attention in the different departments and schools. And so it's been really, really wonderful to have Fahed to work with in this position. And after we did these interviews, Ned and I were sitting together in front of the TV one night and we were talking during the ads that he felt a wonderful sense of everything coming together. His work was appreciated both in the Foreign Service and at UVA, and he felt a wonderful sense of accomplishment. And I'm thinking of that now as he's struggling for his life. He had a stroke uh, this week, and we pray that he will be able to come out of that as he did before and work with Fahed even more. Well, it's such a, your commitment, yours and Nat's work is so impressive. And I, I'm so thrilled that Fahad is here to help you bring it to the next level and to the next generations and to really build that legacy as a very strong one. Um, we send our thoughts and prayers to you and your family and to Nat, and we hope that he is better soon um, mm -hmm. and that he mends well and recovers from his stroke. And I want to take I want to take the time to thank you all for participating and for sharing your ideas. Fahad, thank you so much for joining us as well. And Margie, I know your family just came in this evening, so we're going to let you go and see your family. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice evening. Happy weekend. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.